That's right. Hi everyone, I think we're going to make a start, it being 12 o'clock. So um, good afternoon, everyone who's here, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome, and to all those who are still joining us, thank you for your interest in, um, in being with us on this journey of learning more about young people and their couch surfing. I'm Rhiannon, the Research and Evaluation Manager at Brisbane Youth Service. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm going to be sharing some highlights from the quantitative and qualitative research that we've been doing through our partnership with Dr. Katie Halgeris at Griffith University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ratna Beekman. I'm the, um, pro uh, the project coordinator of the Brisbane Youth Service Couch Surfing Support Hotline. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge and thank the many people here today, mostly based in Brisbane, but also uh, many from further afield. Um, great to have you here. We are based in Brisbane, also known as Mianjin, which locates us on Jagera and Turrbal country. And I'm going to attempt to speak in the language, just two words, Gurumba Bigi, good day, and Wunya, welcome. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first peoples of these lands, waters and skies. Um, I'd like to welcome any First Nations people with us here today and extend my respect and thanks to you all and all First Nations people for allowing us to continuously learn and grow, mainly through the generosity of sharing your knowledge and learning about the diversity in your cultures, traditions and languages. It's an ongoing journey we're all on. I hope that wherever you are today, you acknowledge which land you are on and be respectful now and always. Thank you. Back to you, Yuriana. Thanks, Retna. I'd also like to begin today by acknowledging Brisbane City Council and the Department of Child Safety as the funders of the Couch Surfing Qualitative Research and the Queensland Mental Health Commission as funders of the Couch Surfing Service Evaluated Trial. Um, I'd also like, before we start, just to do a short trigger warning asking everyone who's with us today to be aware that the topics we discuss are likely to involve reference to sexual and physical abuse and assault, suicide and self-harm, child abuse, exploitation, discrimination, trans and homophobia, family relationship and other forms of violence. These descriptions arise from the experiences of the young people who've provided both their information and generously shared their stories so that we could learn from their experiences. We are sincerely grateful for their shared wisdom and insight. So to set the context, almost 44,000 Australian young people under the age of 25 years old are recorded as homeless. While homelessness rose by 14% between 2006 and 2016, youth homelessness increased by 46%. Within the homeless population, recorded rates of couch surfing or temporarily staying in a household that's not your own have also increased exponentially. And almost half of all identified couch surfers are under the age of 25 years old. And we know that youth couch surfing is likely to be disproportionately underreported for many reasons, including young guests in houses not being included in the census data or changing definitions of what constitutes homelessness in data collection. So let's start by asking ourselves the fundamental question. Do we think that young couch surfers are homeless? Let's do a quick poll to see what you think. So, is a couch surfing young person considered to be homeless? I'll just give you another 30 seconds or so to jump in. I can see we've got one popular response already. Okay, interesting. Just another few seconds, jump in, let us know what you think. Okay. 
Okay, let's see the results now. So the most popular response was yes, clearly, that young people, 73% um, of you think that a couch surfing young person would be considered homeless. And actually, that is the correct response, unless you also look at the last one, which for, in the context of what we're talking about today, that one's probably slightly more correct and that we're not actually talking about young people who are taking a cheap holiday by staying on couchsurfing.com or, you know, crashing with friends. That's a whole different experience. If you picked any of the other responses, number two to six, then you've identified some of the common assumptions about young people's couch surfing as a form of homelessness. So let's have a look at some of those assumptions. Homelessness is commonly conceptualized as rooflessness and the rough sleep stereotype in this way of thinking underpins policy and practice assumptions that couch surfing, while it might be a precursor or a pathway into homelessness, is not real homelessness. But a home is so much more than a roof over your head. It's an experience of stability, security and safety. It's a space of belonging. It's an address through which to access income, to participate in work and education and be part of community. For young people, their home is part of their identity development and sense of their place in the world. It's the space where you wash, eat, where you can lock up your things and yourself away from danger. A lack of acknowledgement of this complexity of what home is means that even when it's understood as homelessness, there are widely held assumptions that couch surfing is a safer, less risky, healthier form of homelessness for young people. And this leads to marginalization, invisibility and exclusion of couch surfers from homelessness policy research and at times from support. It also contributes to young people being highly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse while couch surfing into a significant underestimation of the mental health impacts. Through today, I'm gonna to go through some of the, the evidence around some of those other assumptions. Other common assumptions affect the way that we respond to young people who are couch surfing. Young people can come up against assumptions that they're choosing to couch surf. Mm -hmm. When your only real choices are between couch surfing where you can or being in a home where you're unsafe or not wanted, going to a location where you lose your connection to friends, education, employment with all the associated mental health impacts of that, or sleeping rough. It's not really much of a choice then, is it? And yes, many young couch surfers pay varying sums of money to stay in places, but we can't assume that gives them any security and that's what young people have told us. They don't have any stability or protection from financial labor or other forms of exploitation or stress in those environments. And yes, young people do couch surf with a wide range of known and unknown hosts. But even when they're staying with people they know, this does not necessarily mean that they're safe or happy in those environments, or that they're not negatively impacted by the overall experience of their couch surfing. So at Brisbane Youth Service, we've been working for several years with Dr. Katie Halgeris at Griffith University on both quantitative and qualitative research to better understand young people's couch surfing. Our quantitative analysis examined the intake records of more than 800 young people a year for four years and identified patterns of demographics as well as co-occurring issues and risks. We then used these results to move into a qualitative research project funded by Brisbane City Council and the then named Department of Child Safety. And through this, we've completed in-depth interviews with 65 young couch surfers to unpack the hows and whys. And over the last year, we've also been conducting an evaluated trial of a dedicated couch surfing intervention service funded by the Queensland Mental Health Commission, which Ratner is gonna talk about in the second half of this session. So what do you think we've learned? Let's do another poll. Who is it that couch surfs? Have a go at this one. Which of the following statements about young couch surfers do you think are false?
people taking their time to read through them. All right, I'll give you another few minutes. They're quite thought provoking, I think. So our front runners at the moment are couch servers have more professional support. Couch servers are less likely to be at risk of suicide. Spoiler alert, I am going to answer these for you. Okay, just a few more seconds for any last people who want to jump in. All right, let's have a look at the results. So the ones that pe people are most likely to think of false are professional support and less likely to be at risk of suicide. And the ones people are most likely to not think of false are that the majority of young people who seek support are sleeping rough. Most couch servers are young guys. Um, couch servers are less likely to be using drugs than other young people sleeping rough. Let's have a look. So the answers to all of those statements are false. None of them were true. What we see in the data is concerning and challenging to a lot of our widespread assumptions. Since we started this research, I'll just note, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Special Report on Couch Surface has been released. And to me, it was really gratifying to see that their analysis from the period 2011 to 2015 shows the same patterns as we found in our analysis from 2015 to 2019. So these results are not somehow specific to our population. The detail of our quantitative analysis um, has been published now in the Journal of Youth Studies, and I'll include the link at the end. Um, but I'm going to highlight just some of the key points. So couch surfers do make up the single largest proportion of those seeking homelessness support, 28% compared to 13% who are rough sleeping. Of those who are actually homeless at presentation rather than at risk of homelessness, more than half are couch surfing compared to less than a third rough sleeping. Couch servers are significantly more likely to be young women and slightly more likely to identify as LGBTIQ+. They're slightly less likely to be a parent Indigenous or identify a disability. And while it wasn't a strong result statistically, it's also interesting to note that young couch surfers report pretty much equivalent rates of recent substance use, but they were less likely to say that their substance use was a problem in their life. And there's another whole research project. It was when we looked at mental health that the most significant and concerning findings emerged. It was very clear that significantly more young couch surfers described their mental health as poor or very poor compared to all other young people, including those sleeping rough. And that held true even when we controlled for gender. Looking at the results graphically, you can see that the red columns are couch surfers. And less than a quarter of young couch surfers said that their mental health was good or very good, compared to nearly 40% of rough sleepers and 35% of all young people. And alongside this, significantly more couch surfers identify risks of suicide and self-harm compared to rough sleepers and all young people. And while not as, not as significant statistically, couch surfers were also, unsurprisingly, more likely to have been diagnosed with a mental illness. 
And then we looked at young couch surfers support networks. And again, it's not good news. Young couch surfers report much lower levels of support overall, less family support and less connection to services. They do have slightly higher social support networks, which is probably why they're able to couch surf or it's as a result of deliberate engagement with people that you can potentially stay with. So there's a really concerning pattern of young people who are sleeping in other people's homes temporarily with really poor mental health and high risk of harming themselves and who are isolated and disconnected from the people who could be helping and supporting them. Why is this so? I hope at least some of you are old enough to recognize this image. Well, that's, this question is what we're unpacking through the qualitative phase of the research by interviewing young couch surfers about their experiences, stresses and supports. We're particularly interested in the correlation between poor mental health and couch surfing. We had three key hypotheses. So let's do another little poll. This is my last one to see what you think of the three hypotheses. Did we see the high correlation between mental health and couch surfing because we were only sampling young people who were seeking support and young couch surfers only ask for support when they've got poor mental health? Did we see it because people who have poor mental health are more likely to couch surf? Or did we see it because couch surfing experiences have a negative effect on young people's mental health? People jumping in and voting there. We're getting a good spread of responses. All right. Give you a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds, I mean, not a couple more minutes. I've got way too much talking to do for that. And let's have a look at the results. So 80% of you thought that it was because couch surfing has a negative effect on young people's mental health. Um, we've got about 20% thinking it was a sampling issue and 43% who said young people who have poor mental health are more likely to couch surf. Let's have a look at what we learned by talking to young people. Was our sample biased? Are there actually lots of happy young couch surfers out there who just don't come for help so they don't get included in the data? Well, the qualitative research indicates that this is unlikely to be true. By recruiting through services, schools, universities and social media, we were able to talk to a group which were more than half not engaged with homelessness support and their stories really had no significant differences in terms of mental health concerns and other risks experienced. And the second option that young people with poor mental health are more likely to couch surf was also found to be alone, not the cause of the pattern. While it is the case that young people who couch surf have often experienced trauma, developmental disruption, lots of really unpleasant life experiences, these don't significantly differ to other groups like rough sleepers and those who are living in transitional or other forms of homelessness related housing. Young people clearly describe the impact of couch surfing on their mental health and many specifically said that their mental health got worse after they started couch surfing. So while past experiences undoubtedly do have an ongoing effect on mental health, this is not in itself an explanation for the disproportionately high rates of poor mental health among couch surfers. So the most true answer does appear to be the third, that couch surfing does indeed suck on many levels for young people. It messes with their self-worth, makes them feel isolated, excluded, and often invisible. And it puts them in situations where they may be exploited or at the very least living on eggshells, feeling constantly vulnerable, hypersensitized, and anxious. Who did we talk to? Well, 65 young people participated in interviews with our research team. The group had strong diverse representation with 39 young women, 20 men, and six young people who identified as trans or gender diverse. 
Participants ranged in age from 16 to 27, with the largest group 19 years old at the time of the interview, and two were 16 years old, which was the youngest age that we interviewed. The trans and gender diverse young people were on average younger than the rest of the group. Overall proportions were similar to the BYS population that we analysed for the quantitative research in most ways, apart from being slightly older to 73% were in the 19 to 24 year old age range compared to 63% of the quantitative sample, and they were slightly less likely to be Indigenous, so 21.5% compared to 30% in the um, quantitative sample. The main difference was that the young people who came forward to be interviewed were significantly more likely to be trans or gender diverse and more than twice as likely to not be heterosexual. So 48.5% compared to 20% of the quantitative sample. It was really interesting that half of the young people who volunteered to be interviewed were gender and or sexuality diverse. There's obviously a huge overrepresentation both in those accessing support and in the Australian population at large. And we didn't do any specific diversity recruitment. And there were no explicitly LGBTIQ services in the recruitment sites. So there's some really interesting hypotheses arising from this related to both family conflict and rejection as a precursor to couch surfing, and particularly the role that sexuality and gender plays in negotiating couch surfing arrangements. And these are similar in some ways to the hypotheses that we have about why we consistently see much higher numbers of young women couch surfing compared to other forms of homelessness. And I'm going to touch briefly on the issue of sex exchange later today, but there is really a clear need for more targeted research and analysis to unpack the complex relationship between sexuality, gender and couch surfing. So let's hear what young people told us about their couch surfing. We've covered, we, we covered a lot of areas in our interview, way more than I'm going to be able to talk about in great depth today. And rest assured, there will be many specific publications to come. But the key things that I want to overview today include starting couch surfing, how and who they stay with, what happens while they're couch surfing, and there is so much to talk about here. So I'm just going to touch on the big five themes about why it's so hard to couch surf. Then we're going to look at some mental health specifics, touch briefly on the part played by drugs and alcohol. And then we asked young people if there was anything good about couch surfing. So I'm going to share a little bit of what they said, as well as some of their pathways out of couch surfing. And I'm going to touch very briefly on some of the barriers to accessing support. This is the tip of the iceberg of information, of course. We have 65 hour long interviews. Um, but hopefully it's going to be enough to trigger your thinking, to challenge some assumptions and mostly to provoke your curiosity to learn more. So let's start with young people's reasons for couch surfing. Now look, what was really clear was that the reasons young people start couch surfing are not really very different to what drives young people into any form of homelessness. For many, it was about escaping conflict at home. For some, this was cultural. For some, developmental clashes over independence. For some, it was because of their drug use or the drug use of others in their home. For others, it was because of mental health issues, either their own being too much for their family or their family's mental health being too much for them. And for those who are gender diverse, a lack of family support or family rejection was a key reason to why they started couch surfing. Some young people we interviewed were exiting the foster care system. They, in their words, had no home to leave. When asked why she left home, one young woman asked, well, what do you call home ads? Like mom and dad? I never had a mom and dad. She'd lived in more than 80 foster and residential care homes. A common theme was young people being evicted or losing their tenancies and they're not being able to afford or find another property. Overcrowding and no room at home was also a frequently described reason for starting to couch surf. Jenny, for example, said she didn't get on well with her family and when her little brother moved back home, well, there was no room for him and I, so someone needed to go. Changes in parental relationships also led to there being no room for young people at home. Jesse said, before I started couch surfing, I was living with my dad at a house and then he moved in with his girlfriend and yet yeah, I wasn't invited. It won't be a surprise, hopefully, to anyone that violence and abuse at home featured strongly in young people's reasons for starting couch surfing. 
domestic violence of their own or within their families, sexual, emotional and physical abuse, poverty driven neglect and a lack of access to basic resources, all the usual reasons young people decide that leaving is the safer option. So let's move on to where young people stay when they're couch surfing. Unfortunately, when we ask where people stay, the next question would need to be which time. Young people's couch surfing was rarely a one-off event. It was most often a series of episodes of couch surfing, often over many years. About half of the young people told us that they'd couch surfed between two to five times in their lives. Another 18% reported more than six episodes and three had had more than 20 different distinct periods of time couch surfing. For many young people interviewed, couch surfing was a cyclical and ongoing experience across their developmental years. And most young people interviewed had, of course, also stayed in a great, with a great number of couch surfing hosts. During just their most recent time of couch surfing, slightly less than half had only stayed between one to five places. Nearly half had moved between 60 and 50 different couch surfing places. And the remainder, four young people, had jumped between more than 50 places before they found somewhere more stable, if they had. While the average age of participants was 20 years at the time of the interview, the ages that young people had left home and started couch surfing ranged from 11 years old up to 22 years old. While the average was 17, two thirds of interviewees had left home before age 18. So thinking back to the number of places and times young people had couch surfed, it's not surprising that those who were younger when they left home were more likely to have stayed in more places, but they also continue to stay in more different places during a period of couch surfing. So 41.5% of those who left home as minors had stayed in more than 11 places in just their last couch surfing episode, compared to, more than, compared to just 14% of those who left home after the age of 18. In order to keep the interviews of more manageable length, given the number of places people have stayed, we primarily focused on asking people about the most recent time they'd couch surfed. And over the course of the interviews, young people described 144 unique couch surfing places and relationships during their last period of couch surfing. The majority of young people, 48 out of the 65, had stayed with friends at least once during this recent couch surfing episode. Some of those friendships were also instrumental in supporting the young person to move out of a bad home situation. For example, Ria talked about how they crafted a safety plan for leaving home by going temporarily to friends' houses until they ran out of friend options and moved in with extended family. The fact that hosts were very often friends also suggests that a large percentage of couch providing hosts are themselves young. And as such, interventions that are uh, aimed at addressing couch surfing risks by engaging with their hosts need to take this into consideration. Young people drew heavily on their personal and social media networks to find a place to stay. The role of social media in meeting hosts, establishing friendships and negotiating a place to stay was crucial. And even when they had real life friends to stay with, young people used social media to find alternatives to reduce the impact of depending on their friends. As we'll see later, feeling like a burden on the people you're staying with was a very strong theme in terms of the stress that young people experience while surfing. And they chopped and changed places often to avoid burning out their friendships by overstaying. Why is it so stressful? Well, this would require a very long answer. Once we started asking people to tell their stories, we got a lot of information. There's way more complexity than I can do justice to today. But I'll do my best to give an overview of just some of the strongest themes that emerged. When we asked people to describe what couch surfing was like for them, the challenges they talked about could be largely grouped into five key themes. The inherent instability of their living situation, feeling like a burden on the people that they were staying with, lacking privacy in a space of their own, discomfort, both unpleasant, uncomfortable, unsafe living conditions, as well as things that were happening that made them feel personally uncomfortable. And of course, expectations, struggling with the expectations of their hosts, how they negotiated accommodation and what it was they had to do to be able to stay. Obviously, some young people's living situations overlap several or even all of these themes at once. 
The pervasive stress of instability and the constant anxiety about what next was the strongest theme across all young people's stories of couch surfing. A great number of young people characterise their couch surfing as being dominated by both the fear of and the reality of suddenly and unpredictably needing to move on as circumstances or moods change in the place where they're staying. Even when the place is comfortable and safe, they can't relax because they could have to leave at any time. Living with the constant fear of what will happen next has a profound effect on young people's sense of safety in the world, their sense of self-worth and their capacity to have help for the future. Then this exacerbates mental health concerns and then other vulnerabilities, which further undermines their capacity to find housing stability. Several young people spoke of the loneliness of instability. And this seems to be specific to the dynamic of couch surfing, the sense of exclusion and, the, the, and that the stress of homelessness was theirs alone. They talked about how you can be in a room full of people and still feel like you're alone. No matter how kind their hosts tried to be, the sense of not belonging and not being secure left young people feeling isolated, invisible, cut off from the lives of people around them. Young people talked about the sense that the instability of their housing was compounded with all the other life chaos they had to deal with, instability on top of instability. And on a practical level, the lack of predictability of their living situation impacts on everything else work income education relationships how can you make plans when you don't know where you'll be next week this in turn leads to a sense of loss of hope and capacity to plan for the future a surprising majority of young people interviewed were acutely aware of feeling like a burden on others they were saddened by the impact that this had on their relationships with the people they stayed with, and they became hypervigilant to signs of overstaying their welcome or being in the way. Many described the careful planning they used to reduce the burden on their hosts, pretending they'd already eaten, not washing so they don't waste water, doing chores and staying out of sight whenever possible. They often tried to reduce the burden by having time out from the places they were staying, nights out, sleeping rough or in cars or paying for a hostel, picking up a stranger to stay with or crashing in an all night public venue. They became skilled at assessing when they needed to move on. Jasmine described, it's the disdain on people's faces. You know you're putting them out. People should feel comfortable in their own homes and you're making them feel uncomfortable. So you need to get out. This insight around their impact on their hosts was associated with a lot of guilt about being dependent and causing stress, cost or inconvenience. Jaden said, I always really felt like a burden. So I'd jump around a lot, which didn't feel good, but I didn't want to be annoying. Young people described feeling like a parasite. They had no choice and they hated it. And even when people tried to kindly reassure them that they were welcome, they knew they didn't belong and people were not always kind. And of course, constantly feeling like an unwelcome burden exacerbates mental health issues. Young people described staying in a wide variety of shared living environments, lounge rooms, home offices, shared beds or beds made up in other people's rooms. They described a range of privacy issues from living in common areas and having to pack your stuff away each morning to having all your stuff stolen or your personal privacy violated. Janelle told us, I wasn't allowed to argue with them. I wasn't allowed to be like, you're taking my stuff. If I said anything to offend them, I was threatened to be kicked out. Young people talked about how overwhelming it felt to not be able to get away from other people's chaos, to be trying to make yourself invisible and living crowded by other people's lives and belongings. Jack said sometimes he stayed out wandering the streets just to have space by himself. Some talked about never being allowed to be alone in the house where they were staying and an ongoing lack of sleep because they were in crowded, noisy rooms. And you guessed it, not having any space to themselves or privacy or proper sleep exacerbates mental health issues. Discomfort was a really broad theme that covered being environmentally uncomfortable and being exposed to situations that make you feel uncomfortable. So young people talked about the uncomfortable sleeping arrangements, dirty living spaces, lack of access to personal hygiene, overcrowding. They talked about how hard it is to get to sleep when your mattress is next to the TV or in the middle of the party. Young people told us of not being allowed to use the facilities or move around the house. They described not being able to shower or wash clothes and how it felt to not be able to get clean. They talked to being hungry 
either too uncomfortable to eat because they couldn't pay for it or food not being available. Jake talked about how couch surfing often felt more scary than sleeping rough. Yeah, it felt uncomfortable, he said, about whether they were going to hurt me, whether they were going to touch me when I was asleep or something, whether they're going to do something, I don't know, kill me or something. You just don't know. The sense of exposure to unknown or known dangers was often described as terrifying. Many young women acknowledged the high risk of assault. They talked about the discomfort being around violence, drugs, crime, predatory behaviours towards other young women. Others talked about the discomfort of staying with people who had very different belief systems or lifestyles. Some struggled with staying in unhealthy relationships for a place to stay or having to party with people so they don't kick you out. These discomforts were often a desperate feeling. Although they didn't have a better place to stay, they were on edge and ready to leave if things got worse. And yes, this too messes with a young person's mental health over time. The expectations on young people for staying were both different from place to place and often shifted unpredictably within a stay at the whim of their host's mood. Many talked about expectations that would be considered reasonable and fair, helping out with chores, clean up after yourself, contribute food, be respectful. Some were annoyed that they had different or more restrictive rules than others in the house, particularly if they were staying with friends' parents. Others talked about feeling controlled, taken advantage of and exploited. Some were expected to steal food or do other illegal stuff to contribute. Others said they're expected to do unpaid work, to do childcare on demand or care for elderly relatives. Some found it difficult to have the constant pressure to get a job, find a way to move out so they could never have any downtime. While most young people were happy to contribute financially if they could, many said they were still kicked out at short notice. Some experienced financial exploitation, paying large amounts, 150, 250 or more a week. One young woman said she'd been asked to pay, she discovered she'd been asked to pay the entire rent on the whole apartment where she and her children were sharing one room. Many said they're expected not to do drugs as a rule of staying in the house they're in. However, on the flip side, others described having to use large amounts of drugs or drink heavily to party enough to justify being there. Some were forced to use certain drugs and developed addiction. Others talked about using drinking and drugging as a way of hiding the fact that they were staying at a place, making it seem like they were just too out of it to leave. And some were expected to buy drugs for the people in the household in return for staying. And then of course, there were the other ex expectations. There were three main ways that sex played a role in young people's couch surfing experiences, sex exchange, exploitation or abuse, and unwanted sexual relationships. For many young people, whether overtly or deliberately arranged or not, sex was the most tradable commodity they had to secure places to stay. Some were quite upfront about the expectation or arrangement to provide sex in return for accommodation. Some turned to hookup sites to play, find places to stay. Others referred simply to being expected to do things in return for staying. Young people, often but not always young women, spoke about traumatic and widespread experiences of sexual abuse, assault and exploitation, about being coerced, raped and drugged in couch surfing houses. One young man described the difference between doing sex work on his own terms and being exploited while vulnerable and homeless because he couldn't turn down the place to stay. He described it as grotesque but acknowledged acknowledge the paradox of being exploited sexually while being reliant on that exploitation to get his basic housing needs met. Unwanted sexual relationships were not only arrangements with strangers or pickups. Young people also often spoke about the unequal power dynamic of being dependent on, on a romantic relationship for housing and staying in unwanted sexual relationships because it was their only bed. There are a wide range of other heartbreaking stories of young people's secret lives, the stigma they face, the feelings of being invisible, disconnected, marginalised and placeless, both in the places they're staying and in their larger communities. For many, being the odd one out in a room full of people who belonged exacerbated their feelings about their struggles and being homeless. And they acutely felt the sense of being hidden behind closed doors, cut off from a sense of community peers and support. Not always, but too often, young people have to crash in places that are unclean, places where they don't have a bed to sleep in, where it's overcrowded, smelly, 
and unsafe. Two thirds of young people were sleeping in a communal space. Nearly half of these were literally sleeping on a couch. Others were on a mattress on the floor, in a shared bed or moving around wherever they could in the house in different rooms, depending on who else was in the house at the time. It wasn't always horrible. Sometimes young people were made comfortable in spare rooms with their own beds and space to themselves. But sometimes it was pretty terrible. And sometimes they were not actually even in the house, but underneath the house or in a shed out the back. And I think all of this goes towards making sense of why young people consistently said that couch surfing was terrible for their mental health. Some were already dealing with mental health issues, but couch surfing made it worse. And some said their situation was preferable to being in an unsafe or damaging home or sleeping rough in a park. But there was a consistent theme of mental health spiraling down while couch surfing. Several spoke of having to move on from places because their mental health issues became too much for their hosts to handle. Certainly not everyone had a terrible couch surfing experience all the time, but for most, it was lonely, demoralizing, shameful, toxic, vulnerable, and very stressful, and a situation that no one said they wanted to continue to experience. As Jake described, it's the insecurity and it feels like you're in a constant state of limbo and that you don't have something to yourself. You're constantly either owing someone or just being under the thumb of someone else and knowing it could just go to whenever. We did a, a K-10, a Kessler scale assessment with all young people before the interview and not one of the young people in our study scored within the low psychological distress range. 70% fell in the high to very high range for psychological distress indicating that they were continuing to experience high levels of anxiety and or depression, regardless of whether they've been diagnosed and whether they actually moved out of couch surfing now. Australian Health Reports estimate just 10% of the general population of young people have these levels of anxiety and depression. It's clearly critical that young people's experiences of couch surfing are heard and understood by homelessness, youth and mental health service providers, ensuring that young couch surfers don't remain invisible, marginalised and at risk. On an up note, some young people reported that their couch surfing gave them time and sometimes access to support to be able to reach a point where they could go home and live with their families more successfully. Eventually being able to move in with a family member, if not the one they were living with before, was one of the strongest pathways out of couch surfing. And if they couldn't go to family, the other most common out was getting a job. Many stayed couch surfing until they were able to finally get work to afford a place of their own. Despite the challenge of accessing employment and rental properties when you don't have a stable place to stay or a tenancy history. Some young people were lucky enough to meet hosts who became friends and took them in more permanently. Jeremy said, I was lucky enough to be put in a situation where I made some really worthwhile mates who actually gave a damn. And that's the place I'm living, it's safe. We've moved the couches around so I have a bed in the corner and it's the best I've had in almost a year. Some were able to connect with services that helped them find transitional or supported housing opportunities. Others more recently were able to use the extra COVID money to save up for a property of their own. And about a third of the young people were still couch surfing at the time of the interview. The biggest barriers to accessing help were not feeling eligible and not feeling like a priority for services and not knowing what help is available. This was often tied to stereotypes of homelessness and not feeling that couch surfing counted, no matter how hard it was. And this was followed by having had negative experiences seeking help with adults in positions of power in their lives. For several, this involved significant breaches of confidentiality by workers or the friend's parents that they'd turned to for help. We talked with several young people who'd lost trust because the workers they turned to or the people they were staying with called child safety, or despite the young person begging them not to, contacted the young person's parents, which then put the young people in further danger. One had a counsellor who was telling her mum everything she said. This made them feel like they couldn't talk to or trust anyone. Some had heard stories about foster care and feared that if they reached out for help, they'd be reported to child safety and have to go into care. Others had been burned by people who offered help and then suddenly turned away or kicked them out when it wasn't convenient anymore. Many said they preferred to turn to friends and peers than to responsible adults or professionals. 
I'm just going to share briefly that we have done a more in-depth analysis of young people's experiences of child safety involvement before and while couch surfing. And these findings are in a special report that we've just provided to our funders at Child Safety. So um, Katie's details are going to be at the end. If you would like to uh, be notified of when and where that information is going to be made available, please um, get in contact with Katie. So um, just to finish up, when asked about any positive aspects of couch surfing, there were three strong themes, money, relationships and freedom. Young people said that couch surfing allowed them to save money by living cheaply and this meant that they could get the things they needed in life and eventually to find their own place. Lots talked about how much they enjoyed meeting different cool people and some had developed positive lasting friendships with the people they'd stayed with. It may have been hard at the time, but they bonded through the experience. Others were lucky to eventually land in homes where adults really mentored them through things and out the other side. Some found it hard to identify positives, but recognised that it was at least probably better than the alternatives of home or rough sleeping. One said it was good that she got to try out different kinds of shampoo. Many young people talked about how much they appreciated the kindness that they'd been shown and how gratifying it was to be able to pay it forward later and give other people a chance to stay when they needed it, a place to stay. Jake said, I got to have a little more, I guess, independence. I can choose where I wanted to go. I could choose what time I wanted to stay up to. Other than that, there wasn't really much to enjoy. I'm going to finish today with a few words of reflection from one of the research team. After almost two decades of working in homelessness, Phil worked with us both interviewing young people and analysing the interview transcripts. So here are a few of his thoughts about what he learned through the project. And I really hope the video works. So I've been doing homelessness work for 20 years or more at this stage. And I think as workers, we're often um, drawn to the situations of obvious crisis when we're working with people and there was plenty of that um, being related by young people in this research in really terrible situations but one of the things that really stayed with me that young people talked about was the constant churn of anxiety that they felt from not having any stability in their life not having any space um, that they could call their own <clears throat> not knowing where they were going to be um, from one day to the next and has a terrible effect on people, especially over a long um, period of time. There's a couple of other things that really um, struck me coming away from it, and one of them is actually really saddening. There's a lot of young people who don't have people who care about them around them. Sometimes it's their family of origin or sort of other circumstances that they're in as well. But even worse than that, there's also young people who are surrounded by people who are unfortunately all too willing to exploit them as well and take advantage in a whole lot of different kinds of ways. But the best thing that I saw over and over again in what um, young people talked about was the resourcefulness, the resilience of people, even through these dire circumstances, and coming up with all kinds of really creative ways of keeping themselves as safe as possible and living their best life amongst all the difficulties that they're encountering. And I think, again, as workers, we need to remember that's something that young people are bringing with them when they're meeting with us and when they're coming to our services. And that's something that we can harness when we do work with them as well. Thanks, Phil. So that comes to the end of the formal part of my presentation. Um, I am happy to take some questions if you'd like to put them into the Q&A or um, into the chat. I've got um, my lovely assistant, Jackie, is monitoring the chat for me. So hit me up. We've got five minutes or so for questions. And then we'll move on to the second half where we are um, talking about the practice application of some of this learning. All right, so 
I can see question from Lucy. Do you think this is intergenerational? Have their parents also experienced homelessness in the past? Lucy, I think that um, this study didn't specifically ask that question. Um, certainly it is my experience that coming from um, homes where there's poverty and cycles of disadvantage um, that increases young people's general likeliness of um, becoming homeless in the future. But I think couch surfing in particular is less associated with poverty and disadvantage. Um, and it's often young people in suburban homes staying with their friends, their friends' parents, partners, trying to keep up their um, involvement at school and trying to keep life together while they're couch surfing. What did young people say, is another question. What did young people say that they most wanted from the sector to support them? They wanted to know, well, they didn't specifically say they wanted to know that they were eligible, but they needed to know they were eligible. A lot of people said, I didn't think that um, I was a priority. I thought there were lots of people worse off than me. Um, and so I shouldn't go for help because I'd be taking the place of someone who um, deserved it more than I do. And that's, I think, a really sad comment about how young people value their own safety and their own um, eligibility for support, de how deserving they are for support. So I think that um, one of the things that we're going to touch on later in the recommendations is the importance of having really clear messaging to the community about um, including young people who are couch surfing as um, eligible and um, target clients of a service. When we asked them if we waved a magic wand, um, what would you do differently? It was pretty much all more housing, more affordable housing, more ability to get into housing, um, more options, more places to stay, more money, basically. Um, yeah, I think the, the other factor, and Ratna's going to talk quite a bit about this, is the importance of um, people listening to their full story that this isn't just about housing for many of these young people. One more question. Okay. Is there a network app set up for young people to access that has safe background checked people that could offer young people a spare room while they get on their feet? I don't know that that exists. There is couchsurfing.com um, and that has been checked, but that's kind of not really what these young people are using. They're more likely to be using Tinder or um, uh, what was the other one? There's one where you just have dinner with people. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. But they're using relationship connection rather than accommodation connection. So not a lot of background checking going on there. And I think um, part of the point is we need to get people out of couch surfing environments rather than background check the people they're staying with because the nature of the instability and insecurity and it's not really my home is an important part of what impacts on people. So it isn't just about making the environment safer from abuse and exploitation. It's about providing young people with the stability and sense of home that is so developmentally important. Any other last questions, Jackie, from the chat? No, nothing from the chat. Okay. So um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. So if you do have more questions that haven't been able to be answered today, um, please do keep putting them in the chat and then um, we will be able to respond to them in writing and we'll make the chat at responses um, available with the recording of today's seminar. So Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to give you 10 minutes to make a cuppa, take a little break, shake it off. There's a lot of information um, and some of it quite disturbing. So do take a moment to stand up, stretch your legs, do what you need to do, and we'll be back in 
just under 10 minutes five past at five past one. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. I hope everyone had a bit of a break, get some water, stretch the legs. So I'll be talking about the um, evaluated trial, the Couch Surfing Hotline and Mobile Support Services. Um, I'll then share some data from the project and uh, the practice framework approaches used during the trial as a hotline worker. I will talk through the risk screening tool that was developed for the project and how this has been used in practice. Throughout the presentation, I will be highlighting learnings and outcomes of the project, but I'll recap those towards the end as well. Um, we'll also have a chat about what we can do differently, which is also where I'd like to um, see your input and thoughts. So I'll come back to this after my presentation, but maybe throughout um, have a think about our professional practice, what kinds of practice might workers use um, or can we do differently to more effectively respond to the needs of young, young couch surfers? That's question one. And policy, from a policy perspective, what kinds of policies could help make a difference? How can existing policies be amended to be more effective? And the third question is, as a community, how, what can we all do um, to address couch surfing issues in our communities. So I'll keep those thoughts on your radar as, as I go through the presentation, but I'll, um, I'll come back to it after. Um, if you have any comments or chat or questions, please put them in the chat and we'll pick them up a little bit later. So out of the previous uh, research um, with young couch surfers, BYS successfully applied for funding with the Queensland Mental Health Commission to undertake a trial of specialist couch surfing hotline and mobile support services. Just before the start of the project, we formed a community advisory group, which consisted of service providers, academic researchers, people with previous lived experiences of couch surfing, and young people who have recently been couch surfing or were still couch surfing. So we met as a group pre-launch uh, during the project and after the project with the purpose of getting um, the members input, for example, the design of the flyer, which you can see up on the screen. Um, they helped design the appropriate wording of the questions for the intake process, wording around evaluative measurements, how to promote the project to the target groups and also how, um, how to run this forum. So we just had a last meeting in January and uh, the members input throughout the project was uh, very valuable. The trial was launched in October 2019 and we wrapped up service delivery um, in December 2020, which made it a 15, a 14 month evaluated trial. The intended target groups to connect to these services were young people 12 to 25 and particularly those that were not already connecting connecting to services, the hidden ones, um, the concerned families and carers of young people who are couch surfing and couch providers, those people who have young people staying with them for an indefinite period. And of course, any service provider or anyone else who wanted to know more or refer a young pe person to us. The aims of the trial was to increase practice knowledge um, and really, explore effective strategies to identify and response, respond to the needs of those couch surfers who are at risk of mental health issues, problematic alcohol and drug use and self-harm by connecting them with the relevant support services or by engaging in brief intervention or case management or anything in between. 
We also wanted to increase our practice knowledge um, around providing support to families and carers and couch providers of young couch service and identify options and where possible, enable them to better support young people either at home or, or in alternative safe accommodation. We wanted to increase our knowledge around couch providers to enhance the safety and well-being of any young people staying with them and if possible um, to continue to do so. Stabilising couch surfing situations, we wanted to learn more about that and increase our practice knowledge. Um, so because this was an evaluated trial, we were also aiming to gather and share information about effective work with young couch surfers. So our second aim of the trial was to disseminate the learning about responding to the support needs of young couch surfers throughout, throughout the youth homelessness sector. So how were we able to provide supports? What are some of the approaches we used? Increase awareness of the risks of couch surfing in the sector and improve our responses to young people couch surfing and increase early engagement where possible. We collected data between the start and the end of the trial, and I'll take you through some of the stats now. So who called the hotline? We had a number of 198 inquiries uh, made to the hotline. Of those were 61 young people directly contacting the service. We had 20 um, family members and age cap providers, eight couch providers. We were hoping to engage more and intensively with families and catch providers, but as you can see, the numbers are low and there were no real opportunities to engage either in brief intervention or ongoing support. I will talk a little bit more about this later as it is one of our key learnings of the trial. As you can see, service providers are making up a large number of the callers. Um, I see it as, as positive with services either working with or knowing young people who are couch surfing and thereby recognizing that the young person needs support. They are reaching out for help or to gain a better understanding how to support our young people. So indirectly, they are supporting the young person couch surfing or at least trying to refer them on or link them to appropriate services. And as you can see, we've got a wide range of services calling out to us. The age range of the couch surface connected to the hotline um, were a little bit lower, so younger, compared to our overall BYS data, which is um, comparatively sitting at 20%. So this is quite significantly higher. Unfortunately, we, we saw a trend in people engaging at a younger age, people leaving home for a variety of reasons at a younger age. We've had num numerous calls from child safety inquiring about housing options for 15 year olds, which is basically non-existent. Many, if not the majority of young people who access the service had no or limited safe support network or family or friends who could provide a stable place to live, which is heartbreaking, really. So out of the 198 callers made to the hotline, uh, we saw a representation of this demographic. So 58 male service users, Female service users um, was slightly higher, uh, sorry, slightly lower um, than overall BYS numbers and a slightly higher engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And yet a quite a low number of gender diverse service users while Rhiannon talked about almost half of the young people coming forward for the interviews were gender diverse, yet lower numbers are seeking support. So why do people call? The main presenting need remains housing assistance, housing assistance with housing as a first identified priority. This is what young people are primarily seeking support for, which seems logical considering we are a specialist homelessness service. However, through working with the young person, other needs were identified, which may not have been a priority at first engagement. Support with financial assistance was an, identified, was an identified need, which consisted predominantly around Centrelink payments and ensuring they would get the right allowance. Requests for mental health support was quite low. While mental health may have been an identified issue um, or an identified need, there were 
quite a few people already engage with the mental health service or refer to us by a mental health service. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So engaging with the young people when they call the hotline, what does this look like? The service delivery aspect of the hotline was consistent with overall Brisbane Youth Service Practice Framework. We applied evidence-informed approaches such as strength-based, relationship-based, trauma-informed, harm reduction, and cultural safety, solution-focused, and person-centered. These are all in line with our core values, practice guidelines, and policies. There was a lot of advocacy, support letters, phone calls, referrals, generally trying to navigate the complex systems with the young person. There was lots of collaboration with several agencies and services to ensure wraparound support for the young person. A strong focus on building relationships internally and externally during the trial to ensure that young people would continue to be supported after the project had ended. So one of the key learnings, I'm just coming back to some of the approaches that were used in the service delivery. I think most of us are um, familiar with these approaches and we also know that every person is different. So every time we engage with someone, we need to be flexible and open-minded. We need to be aware that we have this toolbox of approaches, experience, skills, knowledge, and we mix and match to ensure that the person in front of us receives the best support or as best as we can assess. So with those complexities and multifaceted aspects of working with young people in this space, I'd like to highlight and share an important learning and reflection from the trial. It is, uh, I was able to apply a slightly different model to commonly used practices in a, in a youth homeless service, which is often crisis driven with an immediate demand for support and solution and a higher caseload, which I respectfully acknowledge. This isn't to say that I didn't have young people in crisis, I certainly did. However, with the majority of the young people, I was able to provide more intensive support and shift the focus from crisis-driven responses to unpacking the risks of couch surfing by going more in depth with the young person. I was asking specific questions relating to their couch surfing environment that are probably not normally asked because of the crisis nature of the work and potentially the assumptions that workers have that couch surfing is not as much of a crisis as other kind of homelessness. This trial therefore allowed me to unpack the subtlety of the risks and the complexities around the young person couch surfing by addressing the kind of risks and other identified needs that young people are experiencing, which are often not emerging as an immediate problem. I was able to apply a model which supports strength-based and relationship-based, which are the very core approaches needed to do this work on a deeper level. It is the relationship of trust that allows us to dig deep, to get to the real risks under the service of the young people saying, I just need another place to stay and found out what is really going on where they are staying and how that is affecting them. So I am aware of the almost unusual position I was in on having, of having had, having had the capacity of operating from a different practice framework and looking at things from a different lens and having a lower caseload. I was able to operate at that different level and, and dig deeper. If we could lobby and advocate for a lower workload, I'm all for that, but that might be wishful thinking. So apart from a slightly lower caseload and a different approach, what was used in practice that was different than, for example, our general intake team or a general homelessness service. One of the great outcomes of the trial was the development of a risk, of a risk screening tool, which I'll, I will show you shortly. As Rhiannon highlighted before, the identified risks associated with couch surfing are different than rough sleeping. And in combination with the common belief that couch surfing is better or safer than sleeping rough, we really wanted to develop a risk screening tool that would address those risks and guide us in our responses. The tool was based on research about couch surfing risk patterns, as well as existing risk assessment tools in the homelessness sector, such as the Queensland Homelessness Information Platform Guidelines, Headspace risk assessment and several other assessment tools. And of course, the research that was completed in relation to couch surfing. 
the focus and the goal of the risk screening tool was to, with the young person, identify and assess their risks in their current couch surfing environment and respond appropriately, either through brief intervention, case management, or an immediate response if that was required. The initial implementation of the tool in practice was sometimes quite rigid. It felt very scripted, partly because of the initial version had 13 questions, which were asked on top of all the other standard questions we were asking the young person. However, as time went on, the screening questions became much more part of the conversations I had with the young person, much more embedded, rather than asking the questions in a scripted way. In saying that, there were a few young people that were happy to go through the questions one by one. Either way, I found that by incorporating the identified risks of couch surfing in conversations with the young person provided a great opportunity to dig a little deeper. especially around the environment that they found themselves in. It became clear that often a young person was not always aware that their couch surfing environment was not as safe as they thought it was. So it also provided a good opportunity for the young person to self-reflect on their environment. The tool was briefly trialled by uh, the intake workers here at BYS, and we were able to adjust the tool and consolidate the questions to make it more user and practice friendly. The tool is a key outcome of the couch surfing project and will be rolled out within BYS and hopefully made available more broadly if people are interested. I'm going to show you the official risk cleaning tool now and I'll talk a little bit more how I incorporated the questions in conversation. Again, if any questions come, come up, please click on the chat. I hope you can all see that. Yeah. How about now? Yeah. Good. So this is the official tool. As I said, we started with 13 questions. However, we consolidated to seven, which um, is much better. Um, and you can see, well, the questions are consistent with the most common themes and identified risks of couch surfing. It asks the worker to talk with the young person and decide on a rating out of five for each of the key risk areas. This then allows us to arrive at a total overall risk score, which was both a guide for practice and a baseline that we could reflect back on after change happened throughout the work or through the work. We reassessed at the end or along the way so that we could um, together recognise how people's level of risk had shifted over time. So when talking with the young person, it was really important to provide the young person the space and time to tell their story. Often reading between the lines, um, revisiting what they told me and asking lots of exploratory and probing questions to encourage them to be more critical and aware of their situation. This is where, uh, then where the identified risks in the screening tool can come in handy. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, where was I? Yes, so we can guide our conversations with the young person um, along the questions um, that are on the risk screening tool. Now, it's important to note that we can't assume that every young person who is couch surfing is at risk. However, we can reasonably and safely say that young people who are couch surfing and are either referred to us or have referred themselves have reasons to do so. So... To use the tool in practice, um, as I said, it's part of the conversation that we have with the young person, um, really exploring where they are, what they need to do to stay there. How does that make them feel? How does the situation environment actually impact on their overall health, their mental health, their relationships, their well-being? 
I can honestly say that often young people, while having these conversations, didn't necessarily realise their environment or situation wasn't really as good as they, they thought it was. Responses such as, I hadn't thought about it that way, or yes, I didn't realise that that was, I was asked to do so I could stay, and coming back to the common assumption of couch surfing, actually coming from the young person saying, well, yeah, I know I have to deal drugs or clean the house or babysit or engage in sexual favours, but if I don't, I may get kicked out and at least now I've got a place to stay thereby perpetuating the assumptions around couch surfing and their own low sense of worth in terms of how they get treated by others. So as you can tell, the tool provided a great platform to open up conversation and encourage and explore with the young person to reflect on what is actually happening for them, what impacts couch surfing has on them, and then what are we together do going to do to manage this so the young person feels safe or safer this in turn helps the young person as well to better understand their situation which in turn helps us to respond beyond a focus of their immediate housing situation knowing and understanding more allows the young people to engage more strongly with support in other areas as well given that young people's housing cannot always be immediately fixed due to the lack of housing options we are then able to at least equip them with the tools, the information, the resources and strategies to tap into when having to couch surf or when their situation might change or escalate. So apart from using the tool with the young people, I've also used the tool with the families and couch providers and some services, talking through some of the risks and what they might need to look out for, more so putting the risks on their radar and increasing their awareness about not assuming the young person is safe. They might well be, but don't assume just because they are staying with a friend. We know that the risks are often, often undervalued or underestimated just when young people are saying, oh, I'm just you know, staying with a friend, or they're saying, I don't wanna be at home at the moment. By having the conversation, it enables us to raise understanding and awareness and again, provide the families and couch providers with the resources and information around services that are available and they can link in with themselves or connect to the young person. So let's look at some of the data and the results from the tool. Does everyone see the risk screenings pre-support? Okay. Good. Okay, so by using the tool at the start and at the end of working with young people, we were able to compare their risks level pre and post support. Over the 40 months, we saw the following. <clears throat> pre support um, was at pre support, young people, 42.5% um, of young people were identified as high or, or very high overall risk level. The young people's most significant risks were seek, were seek, when seeking support are related to the instability of couch surfing and its impact on the mental health and well-being. For the people at highest risk, it was clear that they were highly unstable and in insecure living situations. Mental health issues were related to their couch surfing experience experiences as well as clear emotional health and well-being. The 50% of young people who were found to be at medium risk or just under 50%, they commonly identified mental health issues and a lack of support for mental health to be a key risk factor. The post-support screening was completed either after a short period or after weeks of months of support. So you can see that after support, the screening of the young people, only three and a half percent remained at high risk and none were at very high risk level, which is very positive. 
one, quarter, one quarter of the young, pe young people remained at medium risk level with mental health and expectations of their couch surfing arrangement as the highest identified concern. So when we look at mental health specifically, based on the risk screening results, 38% of young people were identified as having high or very high mental health risk pre-support. And at the time of completing the post-support risk screening, only 3% remain at high, which is good news. It was interesting to see that some young people identified a mental health risk to be somewhat higher post-support than pre-support. This can be attributed to the living environment being stabilized and now having the capacity to address other areas of concern in their life, such as mental health. We saw similar trends in alcohol and other drug use when first engaging. This may not have been identified as problematic. However, after they have stable and safe housing or a place to live, uh, often supports in place, they are much more aware that their AOD or mental health might actually be problematic or a concern. We commonly see this across the youth homelessness network, that when housing is, is the immediate crisis, other issues can be underreported and undervalued. When housing stabilizes, young people turn their focus to addressing the other underlying issues such as mental health. So what can we learn from this? Having access to the right support services and knowing that there are support services that are available to them can significantly improve young people's ability and opportunity to understand the risks that they are experiencing and their own support needs. Whether mental health issues, AOD use, relationship issues, or other underlying concerns. Making sure that those services ask the right questions and have time to ask them sensitively and with trust can enable young people to access specialist support outside of just housing. This means that they can address a whole range of problematic issues that can negatively impact on their decision-making and mental health and thus their capacity to find and keep stable housing in the future. Given the cyclic nature of couch surfing and the fact that, as Rhiannon has said before, many young people have many episodes of couch surfing, we need to build people's capacity to break that cycle by addressing the underlying issues, not just finding another temporary form of housing or leaving them couch surfing because at least they have a place to stay. So a quick recap of the risk screening tool. It can serve mul multiple purposes for different audiences, young people, services, family, carers, couch providers, just to get the risks out there as well. We can use it in a scripted way, or we can directly ask the questions like as a proper tool, or we can have it more in a conversational way embedded in the conversations we have. Using it with young people couch surfing um, it proved to be very useful to identify and highlight the risks and respond accordingly. It can be used as awareness building or educational tool. Um, it helped build self-awareness and reflective skills in the young person, encouraging them to think about couch surfing from a different perspective. And it helps to challenge assumptions that couch surfing is a safe option. So where are the young people now after engaging with the hotline? So we've had 17 people supported through brief intervention and completing the post support outcomes for this, they indicated that they now have connections to services and supports they need, which is quite high percentage, which is great. They also reported being more confident in their choices and having moved to a safer living environment. Out of the 15 people that were supported through case management, after support outcomes indicated they have also moved to a safer environment, high percentage. Connecting to service and support is high up there as well. So what is a safe environment? It could be short-term, transitional, long-term, supported housing, shared housing, private rental, et cetera. Some young people who came through the hotline are still receiving ongoing support through other internal 
teams or will refer to external services if this is more appropriate. It is also interesting to note that a very low percentage of young people move back in with their family, which seems to reiterate that working with families and young people together might need to happen at a much earlier stage. So I've already talked about some of the outcome learnings as I went. I'm just going to quickly recap this. We know that young coach service seeking support are at risk. We had 42.5% assessed at high or very high risk at first assessment and 48.5% at medium risk. Therefore, the risk screening tool being one of the strongest and certainly the most sustainable outcomes of the project. It has been found to work well in identifying risks that may otherwise have been missed in mainstream homelessness responses. The other learning was about the low engagement of couch providers and families. I'm actually interested in your thoughts around this, and I was wondering if you have any ideas or comments about the low engagement of couch providers and families. Did we not reach them because we know they are out there? Um, is there still a common view that providing a temporary place to someone is more accepted rather than reaching out for support? Or is it because our service has youth in it and people think it's focused on youth? Is there something else? So if you have any thoughts, just comment on the chat. It'll be interesting to see what you think. Um, intervention and support reduces risk. Only three and a half percent remain at high or very high risk after support. I think that's a good indicator that support could work. Well, we can't have a presentation where we talk about COVID-19. Promotion of the project after the first few months was less than we had hoped. And engaging and working closely together with other services was impact, impacted due to closures and reducing of staff. And of course, the enormous pressures of those services still operating. While I could tap into BOS's existing networks, establishing new networks proved quite a challenge during this time. The initial engagement with schools was um, showed great potential, but was badly impacted by the timing of the service launch close to Christmas and then COVID, which saw a lot of schools actually closing. We need more awareness. So engage, engagement with other services clearly highlighted the need for greater cross-sector and community awareness of the risks and complexities of couch surfing. While the trial provided a platform to raise awareness, it remains an ongoing need. And another learning is rather than continuing as a standalone couch surfing service, BYS will be integrating the learning across new and existing homelessness response services, such as incorporating the risk screening tool into service delivery. So coming back to the questions I asked at the beginning of the presentation, which I don't expect everyone to have remembered. Um, but this is a good time for you to contribute your ideas. We would like you to comment in the chat rather than the Q&A as our assistant Jackie posts each topic in the chat window. And we can actually save the chat, which is great. We can distribute it after um, the webinar. So I know we have a great mix of services and community members here today, bringing a wealth of knowledge and different and new perspectives, perspectives on couch surfing, service delivery, et cetera. And I'm very keen to hear what your thoughts are on the following questions. So if we can take a minute or so per question, the question will be posted in the chats and you can post your comment there. So the first question is professional practice. So have a think about what kind of practices might we workers use or do differently to more effectively respond to the needs of young couch surfers? So think about how we incorporate the seriousness of the risks of couch surfing in our day-to-day -day practice, not just referring them to a homeless service, maybe. How do we as a family practice, a counselor, a social worker, a GP, 
how do we start to respond to teaching? Do we have some chats coming in? Okay, I'm just gonna read some out. Um, I'll give it a minute or so. Awareness campaigns to the broader community highlight the need for government intervention. Yeah. Safe option. I believe that couch surfing could be viewed as a safe option whereby creating an awareness of the risks of safety to the young people who are couch surfing. Families and young people are afraid of child safety reports and involvement. Better screening of risks. Risk screening, risk assessment process, a great tool to use moving forward with my clients. Flexi school or mainstream school education. Yep. Brochures and handouts and fact sheets, youth friendly for hotspots. Okay, so that's one thing um, I am actually working on is a reference sheet for service providers for to implement in our uh, factors, and it's like a, possibly a two a two pager which um, has the uh, couch surfing risks um, highlighted and some conversation starters, uh, some referral options, referral pathways out of, out of the couch surfing um, sector. So I'll be, um, watch this space, I'll be working on that. Um, moving on to question two, what kinds of policies could help make a difference? How can existing policies be amended to be more effective? For example, a lot of us using Quip, Queensland Homelessness Information Platform. How do we, is couch serving accepted and prioritized? Under 15 year old support, yes. incorporating vulnerability into child protection legislation. Transitional housing options for under 15s. Yeah, that's a, it, it's problematic. It's very problematic. And the many conversations I've had with child safety services around housing options, exploring options for 15 year olds are, are basically non-existent. So how, now let's move on to question three, community. What do we do? What can we all do to address couch surfing issues in our communities? Shelters taking young people under 16 years of age. Amended foster care policy, extending the age. Yeah. Very valid. Early intervention screening, definitely. But first to know agencies to identify risks for young people that might lead to couch surfing. So that referrals for family intervention can begin at the point that the young person first leaves home. Yep, good point. Yes. They're very, very good points you're making and they're all very, very valid. They're all good ways of, of responding better to the couch surfing debate. And I like the comment about going into schools as well, like it's that how we reach, how do we, we help address some of those assumptions that we have around couch surfing among young people themselves as well. Culturally appropriate referrals for to Indigenous housing, yes. 
Excellent. That's great. Thank you very much for all of that. That's really, really helpful. And I'm, I'm going to read all that after and you'll all get a transcript of that as well. So, yep, keep it coming. <laughs> So what can we do differently? Well, based on all your suggestions, I think those are really good um, suggestions to start changing our ways and, and how we look at couch surfing. So we really need to start reconsidering our assumptions. We still have a lot to learn, but it is clear for those of us that working with vulnerable young people, we need to set our, aside, our assumptions that couch surfing is a safer, easier and less risky or healthier option. We need to change the way we speak, changing from, well, at least you have a place to stay and instead explore and assess the environment, ask the critical questions, how staying there is affecting the young person's well-being. And as a sector, we need to find ways to make sure that workers have the time and the support to make time to build trust and understand the deeper issues. The housing system needs to continue to build its focus beyond just immediate housing need and to recognise that breaking cycles of housing, of housing instability requires digging deeper to understand the risks that are impacting young people's well-being. We also need to be clear in defining homelessness as a more than just rooflessness. Services need to be clear in their publicity that homelessness includes couch service so that young people hidden behind closed doors know that they are eligible and able to access support. They need to know that they are a priority as well. We need to improve the risk screening processes for young couch surfers. So assessing those risks carefully and to take it seriously rather than it being a tick and flick exercise. We need to develop the habit of asking the hard questions about how young people are negotiating places to stay and how staying there is infecting them. We cannot be part of change if we don't know the real situation. We can potentially change the pathway of a young person's homelessness and their mental health trajectory by changing how we respond. Mental health and support. We need to be actively aware of the mental health impacts of the insecurity and instability of couch surfing and know that it is often occurring in uncomfortable, exploitative and very unsafe situations. We need to overtly acknowledge and talk about the mental health risks of victimization and other forms of abuse in couch surfing environments, as well as the negative emotional and psychological impacts of the vulnerability, invisibility and isolations of couch surfing. Early intervention and prevention, as we said before, it is early intervention is key. Whether you're a young person couch surfing or a concerned family member, a carer or a couch provider, or working with young people couch surfing in your service, we encourage people to reach out early to try and prevent crisis and escalated situations. It is okay to ask for help. So many young people did not ask for help because they thought there were other people worse off than them. So they would not be a priority un until they were in a really bad way. The earlier that people engage with support, the better for preventing the negative mental health impacts and family breakdowns. To see earlier intervention be a reality, we also need to be prepared to proactively engage with and educate young people and their communities. It is only by building broader awareness that we will start to see bigger change. We need to work together as services, as a society, collaborate, not work in silos, and wrap around support, connect, engage, and link in. And we need to raise awareness. Raising awareness is particularly critical because we have found that many families don't make contact or, or for help until they are already in crisis. And the young person has disengaged, and then it is extremely difficult to rebuild, rebuild or repair family support relationships. We need to ensure that every family, friend or stranger who is hosting a young person in their house knows that support is available before, instead of kicking the young person into the unknown. 
as policymakers and users, we can be more critical of the language and prioritisation in funding and policy. We can critically look at what is in place and where the gaps are so that the broader system supports better practice in this area. Whatever levels we are working at, we can all make a difference and be an agent of, an agent of change. That concludes my presentation and I was wondering if there are any questions. Okay. Can give it a minute. I know it's been a long two hours. And thank you for all the people that are still here. Really appreciate it. All right. Do you engage with young people at school and form guidance officers and chaplains to inform them of these services? Okay. Lucy, um, yes, so we do. Um, we have um, not necessarily if the, for the couch surfing hotline, as, as you can, like, as I said, that sort of was the timing wasn't as good, but we have ongoing relationships with um, some schools um, and we have some young people actually every year coming into BYS and they are aware of our service. But I suppose um, we could do a little bit more in terms of the couch surfing debate. So this is probably addressing homelessness, youth homelessness, but we can probably focus a bit more on, on the aspects of couch surfing um, around that. Yeah. I might join you, Ratna, and um, uh, seeing if I can also help us with any questions. Um, so George has asked if our services are strictly Brisbane based or statewide. Um, we do work predominantly in the broader Brisbane, Gold Coast to Sunshine Coast area, but we also um, do phone response for um, particularly services calling from other areas. Um, in terms of young people, obviously with a place-based response, it's better that we're linking them to services that are local to them. But you can always call us and have a conversation with um, one of the youth workers to link to other support. So, um, yeah. And I'm going to put our contact details on the final slide after we give a little bit more space for questions. Um, so I would really encourage people to make contact if you've got any thoughts, if you've got um, issues that are specifically relevant to you and your areas, if you've got um, an interest in collaborating in other research in this area, or um, you would like to link up around support for building the capacity of your services to work and respond to couch surfing issues. So we've got another question um, about how COVID has had an impact on young people couch surfing. Of course, we can't avoid the elephant in the room of talking about COVID. Um, I think that what we saw in the interviews, they the interviewing process crossed over the COVID period. So we were interviewing pre-COVID and then we took a break during the um, primary period of lockdown uh, and then we recommenced with phone interviews after that which was great for the research because it meant that we broadened our scope away from only people we could talk to face to face and we started being able to talk to people um, all over Queensland and in a broader area um, because we were doing them all by phone. Um, so in terms of how those young people were impacted um, we certainly had some people who'd lost their job um, or been unable to attend school because of COVID and that then impacted on their um, housing and their ability to stay with the people that they were with and they either started couch surfing or they had to leave where they were couch surfing um, because people didn't want them sitting around the house all day. Um, and the payments, as I said during the presentation, had a really 
good impact for a lot of people, as we all know. Um, suddenly getting a lot more money makes a big, builds people's capacity to really change their lives dramatically. Um, so people were able to save enough for a bond um, to move into a new place, which um, was great. In terms of what we're seeing more um, generally, in terms of COVID impact on couch surfing, what we've seen is that there's, there was a fairly steady increase in the proportion of young people who were couch surfing who came for help during the COVID period. So in the April to June um, high impact period, there was a slight increase as a percentage, but a big increase in terms of numbers because all of our numbers went up. So went up by about um, a quarter. So about a 25% increase in young couch surfers accessing for support in that April to June period. In the July to September period, it went up slightly in the post lockdown time. Um, by the end of last year, we it continued to rise as people started to come out of lockdown and then you know have to leave where they were. Um, and then there's been a slight decline so far this year. It's early days still in the January, February period. Um, but what we are seeing is a slight decline in people engaging in support who are couch surfing, but a huge increase in the number of people who are having that brief phone for a quick support phone number, um, brief intervention crisis response. So uh, we have a triage inquiries phone line um, and that saw nearly 40% of young people calling the uh, triage service were couch surfing at the time and so that's a really big increase it's usually around the the 27 to 28 percent um so obviously COVID and couch surfing do have um you know an uncomfortable relationship okay that's wrap it up oh. okay so just one last question before we wrap up for today um did we have any special strategies for engaging young people to participate in research? Young people were paid, just to make it clear. Um, they were, they got a $50 compensation for their time um, and their expertise. And for some people that was an incentive, for others it was about being able to share their story um, and contribute to improving the lives of um, other young people who had those the same experiences. So let's leave it there. We'll leave it there for today so that we can finish on time. So looking at the purpose of the forum or today's webinar was to increase awareness of the complexities of couch surfing as the most common but often hidden form of homelessness for young people. Unpack assumptions about the safety of the couch surfing experiences and apply the learning to practice with recommendations for frontline workers agencies and policy, including approaches and tools for risk screening with young couch service. So hopefully we've given you some food for thought and some practice tools and knowledge to at least start changing the way we look at young people couch surfing. So that's why we'd like to end it today. Well, we'll be sending out an email with um, a short survey and with the recordings of the event once they're available. And with a copy of the tool as well as lots of people have asked for in the chat. Yeah. So thanks very much for your participation and for your time. We hope it was useful and you learned a thing or two. Um, and if you have any more questions, comments or feedback, please email us. Um, so yeah. Last slide with our contact details. Yeah, one, one before. That, yeah, that one. So thanks so everyone. Going back to that one in case you want to take a screenshot or um, jot down our contact details. As I said, we would love to hear from you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care.